Um, over the last couple weeks, uh, I'm preaching this series called Good Reminders. And as I mentioned last week, if you were here with us last week, or if you followed along with Val's videos that he posts online or uh, the sound recordings, um, which are available on the website um, or YouTube, I've been preaching this series on baptism. And the, the stem of it is that we're, we're hosting these baptism classes. So Boris and I have been thinking really critically about how do we teach baptism? What are the, the key concepts of baptism? What are we not being baptized for, but what are we being baptized into? And what does that really look like in our lives? And last week I shared my life has been marked by this sort of unusual pattern of baptism. Baptized as an infant, anointed for ministry much later in life after I came to Christ officially. Um, and this uh, interesting sort of journey of baptism for me has caused me to say, you know, okay, well, what is essential? What is it that is essential about the Christian faith that we really need to get to understand what Jesus means when he says, I don't baptize with water, I baptize with the Holy Spirit. Or when John the Baptist says, the one who's coming after me is greater than I. I baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What does that actually mean to have the Holy Spirit come into our lives and work out God's good grace in our life? And last week I shared from a personal perspective that if you want to be ready for baptism, or if you're sitting on the fence and asking yourself, well, what is baptism? What, is that really, what does that really mean? It simply means to accept the reality that your life is not marked by law, but marked by grace. We live lives under Christ that are ultimately about the grace that God has extended to us. The grace that God created us into, as that song says, 100 billion galaxies, 100 million creatures catching the breath of life. That's what God is inviting us into. And baptism opens our opens our eyes, our minds. It puts a seal on our life that says, from here forward, I'm not living a life of law. I'm going to live a life that's marked by grace. And as I mentioned last week, I've been counseling a friend who's considering this, going through this process of baptism um, and accepting a baptism for himself. And he's been asking questions like, well, how do I know if I'm ready? I said, well, do you know that your life is marked by grace? If you do, then that means you're getting to understanding who God is. If you can accept that, if you can say yes to that, that's the yes that we're saying yes to when we walk in a Christian life. But as I started thinking about it, it's not just personal, right? And that's what the second good reminder is. I think there are really two things that are essential to Christian life. The first is that our lives are marked by grace. From a personal perspective, you are ultimately loved before you're anything else. If you remember back, I talked about, or if you weren't here, I talked about Jesus moving into the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' first words in the Sermon on the Mount are, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. How does he speak these beautiful words with authority? It starts with his own baptism, where he's baptized, and what happens is a spirit descends on him, and a voice from heaven, so that others could surely hear it, not just Jesus, says, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It's out of a foundation of grace that Jesus' ministry begins. It's out of that that his preaching started. It's out of that that his teaching, not about salvation or heaven and hell, his teaching about the kingdom of heaven, the thing he continually preached. That's where that came from, a foundation of grace in his life. But as we get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, what is it that Jesus does with this healing, with this this teaching that comes with such authority. He steps out into the world, and he starts sharing the kingdom of heaven with others. And as we follow in the book of Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount, beforehand is his graceful baptism, and afterwards is miraculous healing. And what we'll find is that that healing is for unlikely people. The healing that Jesus extends and the life that Jesus calls people into is not for who you might think. And as we look at the life of the apostles and the beginning of the church, it certainly starts with the grace of the resurrection. But immediately afterwards, the apostles find themselves moving into questions about like, okay, well, what does the resurrection mean? And Jesus says, it's about you working with other people. And they're like, um, what? 
No, it's about you coming and making everything right in our lives. And Jesus is like, goodbye. And the apostles are standing there. What? I thought Jesus was reestablishing the kingdom. Now I'm stuck here hanging out with Matthew and Bartholomew. And from there, the church began. And that's the church that we live in today. And the essential teachings of Jesus are two, I think. They're one, about grace, and two, about learning to understand diversity. Now, let me start off by saying diversity. When I talk about diversity, the church is going to talk about it very differently than your workplace or than popular culture. How many of you have gone through like a diversity training at some point? How many, how many of you went to school and they taught you about diversity in your classroom or something like that? A lot of us have seen this. Or how many of you have at least seen it on social media talking about diversity and the lack of diversity or controversy of diversity, right? Yeah, it's all around us today. It's a very popular topic. And the general cultural sort of narrative is, well, you just have to get over your intolerance and let people be. That's sort of the value of diversity, right? Except that people are different. But Jesus leaves the apostles in a really interesting predicament. You don't just have to understand that people are different. You have to love and work with and extend grace to people who are different. It's a very different calling. When we say yes to baptism, when we say yes to the Christian walk, we're stepping into a life that means working and living with others. And guess what? If you can accept grace for yourself and you can extend and accept grace from others, that's where you really find the fruit of the Christian life. Punchline of the sermon right up front. The Christian walk is about accepting grace for yourself and extending and receiving grace from others. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I've been experiencing this personally as I've been kind of walking through this season of our life. Lindsay and I just got married. We just bought a house. And yesterday, I had about a dozen people over to the house working on different projects. I feel like after we're done with this and our kitchen's remodeled and it's like December, I'm going to put project management on my resume <laughs> with about a year's experience, right? Putting together a wedding, putting together a house, right? It involves a lot of contracting people assembling timelines, making shopping lists, running out of money in your checking account, being like, dang it, where am I going to get more money? <laughs> That's, and just figuring it out, ordering it all. We've been working through this. And uh, what I've noticed is as I'm willing to extend invites or ask, hey, can you help me out? I am getting a ton of response. And it would be really easy for me to say, oh, no, don't worry, we got it. Or like, oh, no, I'll do it myself, or I'll hire that done. But instead to say, really? Like I called Pavel, who's in the audience today. I said, hey, uh, what, do you know a roofer I could talk to? And he's like, I'll just do it myself. Said, what? <laughs> really? He's like, yeah. Accepting the grace that's extended to me, right? That's a good gift. And Pavel came over, he reflashed my chimney, and it looks awesome. So it's just a shout out to the value of working with people in your midst but also accepting the grace that's been given to you. If you ask for help, you will find it. Like Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. It actually works in life that way when we live lives of grace, where we recognize that we have a good grace and we extend and receive that from others. So I've been thinking about this as I've been working through this and also as I've been talking about that baptism, we really have to understand if we're gonna live a truly genuine, authentic Christian life, it has to be a life lived among other people. And here's the first example. In Acts, as I mentioned, I talked about this narrative a little bit, but it, the story goes like this. After Jesus is risen from the dead, he's standing among his uh, apostles, and it goes like this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And what they mean is like, okay, now do we get our swords out and take down the Romans? And do we establish our temple? And do we reinstate the state of Israel? And Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and to the end of the earth. It's really important to note that the apostles, the Jewish people of the time, didn't think that the kingdom included Judea and Samaria. Israelites were proud nationalists, and Judea had broken apart in the civil war in the area of the kings, and the Samaritans were always this evil other tribe, cursed by God. And so Jesus is challenging them right from the front. No, it's not for you to know And actually, you will be witnesses to more than just a state of Israel. You will be witnesses to the end of the earth. Jesus always included everyone in his plan for establishing a kingdom. Diverse peoples. Peoples that you might not otherwise get along with. And when he'd said these things, they were looking on, and he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. They're like, what did that mean? What are we supposed to do? And while they're gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. To which they're like, well, what does that mean? That's even more crazy. And so here's what they did. They returned to Jerusalem And from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath journey journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room. They went back to what they knew, where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. So imagine this scene, right? They go into the upper room after Jesus is crucified because they're terrified. They're terrified that their revolution is dead, that this Messiah they believed in, the one who is to save them, is gone. All of their hopes are dashed. And we read that it's not just 12 guys, like 12 men in their 20s, It's a church of 120 people. It's Pacific Keep, right? It's like this body of people gathered in that room like, oh, man, what are we going to do now? The government's going to be after us. How do we survive this? And they pull together. And then Jesus comes back, and they're like, all right, now we're going to go back out in the open, and we can challenge the government. And Jesus is like, no, you're building a kingdom of heaven, and it includes all the kingdoms around you. Keep adding people. And so they go back to the upper room, and they're like, did you see that? He went to heaven. They're like, yeah, I know. And there were angels or something. Yeah, and they were like dressed in white. And they want us to just keep doing this stuff? And Peter stands up, and he's like, yeah, I think so. And he starts teaching them about this, recapitulating the teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, reviewing what Jesus did and talking about, wait, wait. Interesting. Jesus was telling us to love other people. He was going out and healing people that we might otherwise keep at arm's length. He was challenging systems that we would never challenge. And Peter starts to teach them about this. And they start to think about it together. And they're built up. And they're working together. And it might be lost on us, but this list of people is a crazy list of people. There are women. Jesus' mother is an older woman and a widow. Joseph is apparently gone, right? Jesus' brothers are there. Jesus is dead. She's a widow, right? And what did the church, what did God call people in Israel to care for? Widows and orphans. All of these people are widows and orphans. Their father is gone. Their leader is left. Widows and orphans, women, and young men. And these young men don't even like each other. Matthew, a tax collector, Right? Worked for the government. Simon the Zealot strictly opposed the government, carried a sword under his dagger in case a government official passed by so he could stab him real quick. Right? These are people that would not get along. And these are people that worked among different peoples, traders and people from far away. They worked with Romans. They were involved with religious authorities. They likely spoke a lot of different dialects and worked alongside other people. And their experiences in life 
their backgrounds, the churches they grew up in, the political affiliations they had, made them all so different that even getting them in the same room would be kind of difficult. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like a church to me. And this is the beginning of the reason that we're here today in Spokane, a body of 120 people. Because people accepted a grace for themselves and then started to share that grace with one another. Which brings me to my first takeaway, which is this. We may not always like it, but in God's kingdom, we have to work together and we have to rely on each other. God didn't, didn't design a world for you. He designed a world for us. This is the world that we live in. This is the grace that we live in. As Julia sang in the song earlier, 100 billion creatures are catching their breath. There are a lot of things happening around us. There are a lot of beings living in our midst. There are a lot of people with different experiences that are being invited into Jesus' kingdom if we have the eyes to see it. It was always Jesus' word when he was talking about parables to say, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, this kingdom is expansive. And it's all based on grace. So we do well to keep this in mind. We have to work together. We have to rely on each other. Because as the Galileans realized, as those 12 apostles and those 110 other people realized, Jesus has ascended into heaven. That same Jesus is not here with us so that we can go and ask him, like, hey, how do I treat people? He's like, I already showed you. The first thought I have about baptism as it relates to this is if we're expecting that, you know, we get baptized and then our lives are all great and everything and everything's going to fall into place and be exactly as we expect, it's not. And if we expect that also we're doing it alone and it's all about our own salvation, it's not. But as we work through difficulties in life, people will come in to help us and we will help other people along. And overall, the sum total is that there is a building of a kingdom, a building of a group that's something completely different from what we've all heard and learned and thought about. The diversity of the kingdom of heaven is not the diversity of your workplace. It's not about just accepting people. It's about doing it with people. And so it goes on. What happens after this? So there's this 120 group of people. They're talking. What happens with this group of people? It says in Acts, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, all of the people of God. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's like Peter's preaching outside and his microphone is getting that wind feedback. And all of a sudden, everybody's like fired up, and people are clapping and jumping up and down. And everyone in the audience is like, what is happening? And there were, dwellings in, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And this is talking about the expansion of this Jewish kingdom, right? There were Samaritans, there were Judeans, there were Galileans, there were people from every, every uh, facet of the Jewish uh, kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Remember, Jerusalem and uh, the country of Israel is made up of 13 tribes. Much like in South Africa, there are 13 tribes, and all these tribes speak different dialects, because they grew up in different tribal cultures. They grew up in places where they didn't walk, you know, 300 miles to the next city. They stayed where they were, and they traded and talked. And so there are different dialects in this Israelite culture. And these people are astonished, saying, are not these all Galileans? How is it that we hear each in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, because Israel was attracting people in after the conquests of the kings. There were people coming in from other areas, from Asia, from Greece, from places where they spoke different languages, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, 
to the south, Egypt and parts of Libya and Africa to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, Romans, government officials who were there, who were in this audience, who were just listening as Peter was talking and the wind is rushing and people are getting excited about the things that are being shared, both Jews and proselytes, people who are coming to the faith, Cretans and Arabians, people from the Middle East, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. There were people there who were excited about the message that was being shared. Peter had been growing in confidence, teaching the apostles. And all of a sudden, they get together, and they decide, let's do this out in public. And they preach, and people are moved by the message of Jesus. Like, all of us in the room, or some of us in the room, have been touched by the message of Jesus at some point, right? Yeah. And it's exciting. When you hear somebody talking about something that validates the experience that you've had, you go, yeah, that's right. God has extended grace to me. Hallelujah, and we throw our hands up, and we get excited, and then people see it. But there are always going to be skeptics, aren't there? That's the challenge when Jesus is ascended to heaven, when we're left on our own to do this. Our witness really depends on how we work with other people. If we're accepting and extending grace, man, that's attractive. If we're not, I don't know, it looks a little crazy. But even if we are doing it, it looks crazy to people. Or they're like, you can't tear apart your kitchen and just get it done in a couple weeks, right? Maybe you can if you know the right people or if you're willing to say yes, if you're willing to invite people in. Or people go, you can't just, you know, fill your church with people, like, they're not just going to come in because they're inspired by grace. Like, yes, they will. People think it's crazy. They go, you just get together and sing songs. It's like, no, we actually get together in groups, and we know each other well, and we meet each other's needs. The world looks on. They see something completely different because they're not filled with grace. Their lives are not marked by grace. And I think it happens in more normal ways. Notice the story I'm talking about. We hear this like tongues of fire thing and we get like this mystical vision, but it sounds pretty normal, doesn't it? People coming in from different countries, they're just hearing this preacher talk in the open air um, and this group of people that's all excited and people are drawn in and they start going like, these are Galileans, how are they speaking our language? But then we remember that Simon was a zealot and he worked with people from Arabia and Cyrene. Or we remember that Matthew was a tax collector and he spoke high Greek, he spoke Roman, he spoke the, the languages that were shared around, which Roman would be Greek. But anyway, he spoke languages of the trades. And then we remember that there were also fishermen who would have worked with people from Africa, Libya and Cyrene and Persia, right? We hear these things and we go, wow, actually, this makes more sense as I think about it. But the words of grace only strike us if we're ready to hear them. And it happens through tongues. It happens in our own language in a way that strikes us personally. And it only happens if others are willing to do it with us. I was recently talking to our brother Val, uh, Val Soldonkin, who uh, films us at church. And um, Val and I were hanging out, and he was telling me about how he came to Christ. And it reminded me a lot of this scene because it was just so interesting. Val was... uh, kind of a, he would share like, sort of like a punk kid, didn't really care about what was going on at church. And he uh, was invited to this youth group to translate for this homeless guy who'd stepped in. So this homeless guy had come into the church, and someone said, Val, Val, you got to come and translate for this guy. And Val was like, uh, all right. So he goes inside, and he's sitting down, and he's listening to the pastor who's preaching and talking about sin and redemption and grace. And Val is sitting there and he's translating to this guy. He's receiving in in Cyrillic, and he's speaking the Russian, the English. He's talking to this homeless guy. And this homeless guy at the end gets up, and he's like, all right, cool. He walks out, and Val falls on his face, repenting. He falls on his face. He says, I never realized who Jesus was, because Val had a gift, and he was invited in. Someone extended a grace to him. And he received through this gift of tongues, right, sharing the language, through just being around grace, through 
being with other people, using the diversity of skill and language, it was that that actually brought Val to Christ. See, some of these things are more normal than we think. So Val's there, and he's like, and then his homeless friend is like, these people are filled with new wine, right? But if you're ready to accept grace, and if you can extend grace to others, man, that's where the kingdom becomes a reality. Amen? That's right. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of this Anthony DeMello quote as I think about Val's story. Anthony DeMello was a Jesuit priest, and he says, the only way that someone can be of help to you is by challenging your ideas. And man, did Jesus challenge ideas. Jesus challenges ideas all the time. He challenged their idea of what the kingdom meant, of who was accepted, of who was in and out. He challenged their idea of what it means to actually live with others. It's not just about tolerance. It's about love. Challenging idea. And when we invite Jesus into our heart, that challenge is constant. Which brings me to my second takeaway. God works through many different people in many different ways. At that preaching at Pentecost, I don't think any of those people expected to receive words that would lead them to life. But Arabians, Africans, Middle Easterners, Jews, Greeks, they're all sitting there listening to Peter, and they're like, whoa, this is changing my life. The diversity of the kingdom is a gift to everyone. The diversity of the kingdom is a gift to everyone. There are many different churches, you guys. There are many different churches out there that preach a lot of really good things. Often I feel like we dig in our heels to like what we believe, what's my theology, what's my feeling, rather than saying, hey, that's really great. Let's invite more people into this good grace that the church is building in the world. Let's work with other churches. Let's just celebrate the fact that we have a good gift here. If we can accept that diversity and love, man, we can focus more on our own growth. We can focus on building up something bigger than ourselves, bigger than our reputation or our own feelings, or our own theologies. We build up the kingdom of heaven as we work with others. It's a great, great, great grace and a good gift. Later, it goes on in Acts and it says, now when they heard this, the people who were sitting there, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. Peter is saying, yeah, you're getting this gift. Now you get to give it back. And as you do, you will see this thing build, and it's better than you could imagine for yourself. So those who received this word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Church, if you're here today, if the God of grace has touched your heart, if Jesus has become a reality for you, if you have learned something about the goodness of God, it's because people were willing to extend grace to people different from themselves 2,000 years ago. Man, we need to do the same. If we want to see a kingdom built, it starts with diversity. It starts with us accepting grace and then extending grace. And this is really powerful for me. It goes on, it says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, doing normal stuff, just day after day living, not big oratory speeches. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In just ordinary life, people were coming to know the grace of God through these people. It was in work and play. It was in exciting and unexciting things. It was in the mundane acts of cooking and grocery shopping that people were receiving the grace of God because these people had accepted and given grace to others. Which brings me to my third takeaway. God's people are the primary way in which God will work in your life. 
if you're a baptized believer, if you're a believer, if you're in the fold, if you consider yourself a Christian, you are the work that God will do in other people's lives. The Holy Spirit that is in you will work through you to extend the grace of Christ to people. Often miracles happen in unlikely ways with unlikely people. If you had probably asked somebody about Val before he had this experience, people would say, like, I don't know about Val, you know? And I I don't know about this homeless guy. He's probably just going to leave, which he did, right? But somebody said, you know what? Maybe a miracle can happen here. And a miracle did happen there. Yeah, that's right. Mila's like, yeah. (laughs) A miracle did happen there. Miracles happen in everyday occurrences. They happen all the time around us if we have the eyes and the ears to hear them and see them. So what about Jesus? I mentioned Jesus' Sermon on the Mount at the very beginning. How does Jesus actually teach us this? I really want to hit this point about diversity home, this point that Jesus' his message was for the ends of the earth from the very beginning because here's what happens. He goes up and he preaches for all of these people in Israel, and there are people coming in, right, as he's preaching in this mountaintop, which is probably more of a hill. If you've ever seen, like, pictures of Israel, there are not mountains. They're like little hills. Um, and he heals two unlikely people, a leper and a centurion. A leper would have been an unclean person. According to Jewish law, leprosy had no cure. And actually, uh, modern medicine would tell us that leprosy still has no cure. In the 20th century, people were being shipped off to islands because they had leprosy because they didn't know what else to do with them. We just need to get them out of the population because it's going to infect everything. Lepers were unclean. If you had leprosy, it was really bad. And in Jewish culture, that was associated with a curse by God or some sin in your life. Lepers were not able to be healed. It didn't happen. But in the history of the kings, there was an unlikely person, Naaman the Assyrian. He was this, uh, this kind of scoundrel, right? He was a big villain in the king, kingly era. He uh, was a, a, a military leader for the kingdom of Syria, which was causing a lot of problems for Israel. And Naaman was healed by a prophet of God. And there's a story about it in Kings. You should read it. And Naaman is he's sent to a pool and he washes. And immediately after this, it says that Jesus spoke with authority, not like the scribes, but authority like from God. And immediately he goes out and a leper comes and he falls at his feet. And the leper says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him and said, I will be clean. One, incredible power. Two, incredible authority. Who can cure leprosy but God himself? The unclean is made clean immediately after Jesus teaches what he came to teach, that the kingdom of heaven is expansive and that this grace is better than you could ever imagine. He shows it right away by cleansing a leper, the most unclean people. He tells them, go and just show that you've done the purification right by Moses, which is what Naaman did, which just brings together this whole piece that God has been in the business of making people clean, of healing the earth from the very beginning. He started a good creation. He called us into it in grace, and he's inviting us back into it. And then the centurion comes up to him, a Roman soldier. Roman soldiers were like the worst thing you could be. That's like a hundred, that's like a guy who runs a used car lot, right? Who hires like a hundred used car salesmen. People are like, ugh, this is the worst kind of business, right? If you own a used car lot, that's awesome. It's good business. But it just has that negative connotation, right? It's sort of like that. Or like if you own a law firm, it's like, oh, lawyers. They're the worst, right? If you're a lawyer, that's great. Being a lawyer is awesome. <laughs> um, and the centurion comes up and he says, Lord, my servant is laying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And, he said to, and Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion's like, whoa, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just say the word. You don't need to come, like, just heal him. I know you have the authority. My servant will be healed, for I too am a man under authority, when soldiers under me, with soldiers under me. And if I say go, he goes. If I say to another come, he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. God of the universe is marveling at this guy. Truly, I tell you, says Jesus, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. 
I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham. Whoa, that's a revolutionary statement right after a major teaching to people in Israel. People from east and west are going to come and recline at the table with Abraham. They're all being made sons of God. And Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Israel. Well, the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they're not going to get it like this guy gets it. This guy understands the grace, and he's extending grace. And he comes to Jesus not on behalf of himself, but on behalf of a lowly servant. Those were expendable, right? Those were like parts for your car. You know, if it stops working, like, okay, I'll get another servant, you know? But this guy comes, a man with authority and a lot of authority, and says, I want my servant to be well. He accepts grace and recognizes it, and then he extends it. And Jesus says, yep, that's it. And Israel is going to take a long time to get this right. And if we look at the history of the church since Jesus, I think we have had a hard time both of accepting our own grace and especially of extending it to others. Definitely weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's dark. And the servant was healed at that very moment, an unlikely person in an unlikely way, in a way that no one would have thought by Jesus. And as I think about this, it just all comes together for me that if you hear one thing from the sermon, I want you to remember that phrase I've been saying over and over, accept grace for yourself, extend it to others. That's the seal of the Christian life. Those are the good reminders that we need to be telling ourselves every single day. It's that mentality, that action, that line of thinking and believing and working that transforms our lives and transforms the world into the kingdom of heaven. It's what Jesus came to do. It's what Jesus calls us into, and it's what he's empowered us to do with the Holy Spirit. That's what we're saying yes to in baptism. That's what the mark of the Christian life is. That's what makes the church different. So here's my challenge to you. Are you open to God working in your life through unlikely people? Are you really? Where are those places where it's like, man, maybe God can actually work with that person. I've just written them off or I haven't even thought about that. And where might God be working that you might not be seeing? I'll tell you what, I, it's really simple sometimes. I was really stressing about getting our house ready so we can move in in October because I have a lease ending on an apartment. I got to move stuff in. And so I called a bunch of friends. I had no idea if they would respond. They were all very different people. They come from different backgrounds, right? Different places in my life. Some Christian friends, some non-Christian friends. I reached out and I said, hey, can you help me out? And yesterday, we got so much work done. It was amazing on that house. I'm really blown away. And it's a simple thing, you know? It's not like it's earth shattering. But to me, I stepped back yesterday and I watched people working. And I just... Realize the grace that is there. And I said, man, this is a little picture of heaven, I think. Different people coming together, working together to build something that's more than just themselves. Like, nobody's getting stock options in my house, right? If you build up a company, maybe you'll get a kickback. But, like, that's not the way it works with property, you know? And I just realized, this, how, this isn't my house. This is a kingdom dwelling. This is a place where heaven is being glimpsed. What if we thought that about our own homes, about our workplaces? What if we thought that about this church, that this could be a place where we accept our own grace, but where people that we contact every day, new visitors, people that are coming in, are receiving the grace of Jesus? How beautiful would that be? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you will um, just make visible the signs of grace in our own lives to us. Help us to share them with each other as we talk and pray for each other. Help us to share them in just normal things like birthdays, and dinners, and work parties, and stressors, and areas where we might need help, like when a baby is born or when someone gets sick. Lord, help us to see that we're not just recipients of grace, we're extenders of grace. And we can receive grace not just from God, but from others. Or as we say yes to you, we're also saying yes to our community. Lord, we pray for those in this congregation that are on the border. Do I want to say yes? Help us to be a community where that yes actually looks like the kingdom of heaven. 
In your name, Lord. Amen.